Thank you, Mark. I would. I know that we're a little bit behind schedule now, and I would make a half-hearted attempt to help get us back on track, but I, I think we all know that lawyers from Texas can't be trusted to do that. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to address uh, at the outset is uh, the, the title of my talk is, is uh, Southern Baptists in the World. And I did just want to clear the air and indicate I did not select that title. And in fact, and in fact I did push back against it. Um, Mark, Mark uh, sort of came back and said, no, 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 this is, this is great, it'll be really interesting. Which in turn raised its own questions like, why, why would that be interesting? Are, are, we, are we that peculiar of a, of a uh, sect that, uh, that um, well anyway, so uh, what we're going to do uh, is, uh, is sort of two things. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about some of the Southern Baptist uh, uh, documents, I don't want to call them documents of policy, I'll just refer to them as resolutions that are passed uh, each year and draw some observations about um, our sort of approach to thinking about uh, the world and to thinking about conflict uh, and to thinking about uh, what, are, what are nations and what are our places in them. Uh, and then I'm going to use that kind of last point uh, as a springboard to, to then discuss uh, another issue which is, uh, which is of course related uh, and that is immigration and, um, and uh, offer a couple of responses to uh, Mark Amstutz's book uh, just immigration, I'll show it to you. If I'm responding to it, I might as well give him a book plug. Um, uh, who I believe is here, but he's actually speaking about this book on Capitol Hill right now, so I, I, unfortunately he's not in the room today. But next week. next week? Oh, it's next week. Ah, interesting. Okay, well, I'll have to go check it. Maybe I'll throw him some fastballs uh, from the audience. Um, but. Um, uh, and then sort of end with some observations on, on, uh, on moving forward. So, so Southern Baptists, we gather every, uh, every summer. Uh, this, this coming year, we're, we're gathering uh, in Birmingham, Alabama uh, for our annual meeting where we carry out uh, business. Uh, we report on numerous committees, uh, committees on committees, uh, task forces, and other committee-like groups of people. Uh, but one of the other things that we do is we, um, is we uh, consider and pass uh, resolutions. We've done this uh, from the beginning uh, since 1948, and interestingly, 1840, 1845, excuse me. Uh, and all of our resolutions actually are searchable on our website going back to 1845, uh, if you find yourself with uh, any spare time or deranged interest. But over the last 20 years, the SBC has passed a number, as you can imagine, of resolutions dealing with the issues of international affairs, the persecuted church, uh, uh, war and peace. Uh, and these sorts of things. And so from these, I, as I mentioned, what I want to do is draw out three broad themes. The first is to talk about um, our approach in thinking and just war uh, within a just war framework. The second is religious liberty. And then the last is uh, to touch on communitarianism. So resolutions that have been issued after the, the conservative resurgence consistently apply uh, and discuss and work within uh, a just war framework. In case you don't know what the conservative resurgence is, it was a period in the 1970s and 1980s uh, when uh, uh, a group of biblical literalists, theological conservatives, um, I hesitate to say retook uh, control of, uh, of the entities of the Southern Baptist Convention, but that's, that's basically what happened through these committees on committees and various other, uh, various other structures. Um, and so, just as a quick sidebar, our resolutions on, um, you know, during the Vietnam era and, uh, you know, and, and uh, the Korean War and so forth are a bit different than, uh, than, uh, than sort of the current thinking, certainly going back to the beginning of the War on Terror. So my, so my, um, uh, my focus will, will be on those. So the, the, first, the first sort of notable uh, resolution I want to mention is resolution on the genocide in Sudan uh, in 2000. Um, and in 2000, the SBC passed a resolution calling the situation in Sudan a genocide and describes the, de the situation in, 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 in fairly, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a significant amount of detail. Broadly, the focus on, uh, within the resolution is on humanitarian aid. It refers to uh, the, uh, and, and relief for victims of the conflict. But the last paragraph of the resolution reads as follows, resolved that we urge the administration and Congress to use appropriate means uh, to compel the government of Sudan to stop these vicious atrocities and ongoing violations of religious freedom. 
And so, you know, this is obviously not a rich discussion of the just war theory, but, um, but I think as, as I'll show in the next, uh, with the next couple of resolutions that were passed in 2002 and 2003, I think this framework is sort of assumed in Southern Baptist thinking about what would be appropriate means and, and how might they be deployed. So in 2002, the SBC passed its, its first resolution since the, the attacks um, on uh, the United States in 9-11. Um, and this resolution grounds uh, the purpose of government, of course, in Romans 13, uses a moral framing of the conflict, uh, applauds President Bush's use of the term evildoers to describe, uh, to describe the hijackers and the terrorists. And although the resolution doesn't tick through the sort of elements of the just war uh, framework in a systematic way, um, uh, it, it does address sort of the core concerns for uh, the intervention in Iraq, such as uh, just cause. It, it specifically talks about uh, self-defense and addressing a, a serious and ongoing threat, um, as well as proper authority and, and right intention. Um, interestingly, the, the resolution also lays a predicate for support um, of Operation Iraqi Freedom by its reference to, and I'm quoting here, the growing threat of terrorist supportive nations and the growing quest to attain weapons of mass destruction. So in the following summer, the SBC, uh, so this is 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom started in March of 2003, uh, so this, we, we didn't have the opportunity to weigh in directly on that. Uh, but the following summer, the, the SBC issued a resolution offering sort of a retroactive blessing um, on uh, the war in Iraq uh, that, had, that had just begun uh, uh, three months before. But in the intervening time, of course, Richard Land, who was then the president of, of my organization, the, the ERLC, uh, had drafted what, what's uh, sometimes referred to as the Land Letter uh, in October 2002, which did contain, if you haven't looked at it, a point-by-point -point application of the just war principles uh, to the situation um, in Iraq. And so the 2003 resolution does not recount these, these points in great detail, but rather states in summary, whereas we believe Operation Iraqi Freedom was a warranted action based on historic principles of just war but there has been a shift over time. Um, uh, a resolution in 2006 was passed on the conflict in Darfur, and the focus of that resolution, you remember 2006 was you know, kind of the beginning of turning of American attitudes um, on some of this stuff. Um, there, there was discussion about the use of force, but in the context of UN peacekeepers and whether the, the government in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Sudan was going to allow them to come into the country, use the language of humanitarian crisis, which of course it was. Um, but the, the, the framing of the conflict is a little bit different than uh, in moral terms than what we saw in 2002, 2003. Uh, certainly the, just or, the justice or deployment of US forces was not contemplated or, or considered. Um, which brings us to the SBC's resolution in response to the Arab Spring, which I think is sort of the starkest example of this, um, which was entirely focused on religious liberty, not regime change or military intervention. When it came to the foreign policy of the United States, the messengers called upon, and I'm quoting here, our political, diplomatic, and military leaders to make religious liberty for all people a priority in decisions of foreign policy and international aid. Note also that the title of this resolution, which was on religious liberty in a global society, if you were kind of like looking at the table of contents and trying to find out oh, what did the SBC say about the Arab Spring in that period, you probably wouldn't have uh, clicked on it. Um, and certainly not, not a direct reference to the winds that were then stirring uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. So I don't mean any of this to be a criticism of, uh, of non-interventionism in, in Syria, but just to uh, draw out a point that I think what, what's happened over the, last, um, over the last few years is not a shift in opinion about just causes or last resorts uh, or right intentions or even the applicability of, of just war theory more broadly, but rather um, concerns about a reasonable likelihood of success. In fact, um, Russell Moore stated this exact, explicitly, my, my boss Russell Moore uh, stated this explicitly in 2013 uh, when the U.S. was contemplating intervention uh, in Syria over uh, Bashar al-Assad's use of chemical weapons. And what he said then was, you know, look, there's no shortage of, of just causes when you survey this conflict. But I think the question that we have to grapple with is there actually a reasonable likelihood of success. Um, but in an effort to say and do something, what the SBC chose to focus on in this particular, con in this particular situation was religious liberty, uh, which, which of course is you know, one of the key issues uh, of that, you know, of, of all of those issues and, and, and certainly of the conflict still going on in the Middle East 
uh, in North Africa today, which sort of serves as a transition to my second point, which is sort of a global focus on religious freedom that, for, I mean, honestly, uh, was kind of surprising uh, to me to see just how much this, this came through in our resolutions. Religious liberty, of course, has long uh, been an issue for Baptists. After all, um, you know, religious liberty is, is my organization's uh, middle name. We're the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. Um, but the salience of this issue for, for Baptists is, is really our history, which is spending time uh, in colonial jails for refusing uh, to, to get permits and licenses to preach. Um, and championing the idea that the United States uh, must avoid establishing a state religion. Um, but it's also a matter of core theological conviction. Uh, 1995 resolution, religious liberty and world evangelization, not exactly um, good optics these days, pairing those two things up together, but in, anyway, uh, which stated, we reaffirm our Baptist heritage in, in supporting the right of freedom of conscience in religious concerns and the right to convert or change one's religion, uh, not due to coercion, but due to uh, alteration of conscience and, and conviction. And this history was again sort of reaffirmed and elevated in the 2011 resolution uh, that I mentioned a moment ago in response to, uh, in response to uh, the Arab Spring. I'll just highlight one, one section from that, which says, this conviction is grounded in the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, who declared that his kingdom is not of this world, and therefore he has not authorized any earthly realm to advance his kingdom by the power of the sword. Um, and indeed, even our resolution on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in 2002 uh, uh, features this, uh, this, this idea of religious freedom very prominently. When, when calling upon the, Israeli and Pal the Israelis and Palestinians to promote peace, it lists religious freedom actually first, before peace, resolved that we call, on, we call upon the Israeli and Palestinian people to pursue policies that promote genuine religious liberty and peace between themselves and their neighbors. Kind of a, it just sort of struck me as interesting that uh, we chose that priority. Um, this brings me to the last point that I want to talk about, which is kind of a Southern Baptist view uh, of the modern uh, Westphalian international system of sovereign uh, nation states. And uh, the sum of, of our resolutions on this sort of paint a picture that Southern Baptists believe that each nation is sovereign, uh, that, that while international organizations have a role to play, I mean, there are, there are several positive references uh, towards treaty bodies, towards the work of the UN, particularly when it comes to protecting religious minorities and other persecuted groups of people. Uh, but there is still a, a skepticism towards international organizations that, that sort of pervades uh, uh, our resolutions. The, the most prominent of this, of course, uh, is a resolution that's titled using language that really unfortunately hasn't stood the test of time. Uh, that is, it's titled On the Threat of New Age Globalism uh, in 2002. Um, and, and in the interest of time, I, I won't read from this one extensively, but, um, but as you can imagine, it, uh, it lays out a, a fairly robust vision of national sovereignty uh, and skepticism for, uh, for the UN. The 2002 Middle East uh, peace resolution I mentioned earlier uh, does the same thing with uh, recognizing explicitly the, the sovereignty of the state of Israel, implicitly a uh, future state of the Palestinian people. Um, and then in 2015, there was another resolution uh, dealing with human rights violations in North Korea. Uh, and there, the messengers adopted uh, a resolution uh, that, was, that was critical, but it also provingly uh, referenced, referred to uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and, uh, and several uh, sort of treaty processes within, uh, within the UN. But the place actually where um, our view of national sovereignty uh, and particularly the sort of protection of our borders uh, is most clearly illuminated uh, is with our three resolutions that deal uh, with immigration. So the first of this was in 2006, an uh, a uh, resolution titled On the Crisis of Illegal Immigration. Um, and this, this resolution begins with laying out kind of a two kingdoms approach. Uh, I'll read from this, where, whereas Christians have responsibilities in two realms, uh, as citizens of the nation and as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. And then going on to say, as citizens of the nation, Christians are under a biblical mandate to respect the divine institution of government and its just laws. But at the same time, Christians have a right to expect the government to fulfill its ordained mandate and enforce those laws. A 2011 uh, 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 
resolution on immigration took this a step further, uh, touching on the issue of border security specifically, saying the, govern the governing authorities of a nation have the right and responsibility to maintain borders to protect the security of their citizens. Uh, and then a 2018 resolution passed this last summer reaffirms and, and furthers all of these ideas. So I want to use this, let me just take a drink of water real quick. So I want to use this as a, as a starting point, this idea of national sovereignty, uh, border security, the, the right of every nation to determine um, who gets to live within its territory and so forth, uh, to, to interact with uh, Dr. Amstutz's book, uh, Just Immigration. Now, Dr. Amstutz, of course, has played uh, an important role in the founding of this, of the of, uh, Providence Magazine. Um, and I thought he was gonna be here for this conference, but, but uh, but I'll, I'll have to catch up with him next week. But let me just say at the outset that I think that his, his book actually offers an important contribution uh, to, uh, to this discussion. And there, you know, there are some things that, that I disagree with. It's his, uh, spoiler alert, his, his book is somewhat broad, is, is somewhat critical of, of my organization's work uh, in, the, in the area of immigration. But I think, you know, I think that his approach generally is pretty fair-minded and I think it helps to advance uh, the conversation. Um, but I do want to offer two responses. The first is Dr. Amstutz points out that many of the actors within the immigration debate have adopted, whether knowingly or unknowingly, a cosmopolitan view of the world and therefore migration issues as well. And one of the problems, of course, with the cosmopolitan worldview in the context of immigration is, is that if, if we accept the idea that every person has the idea to immigrate with, with an I, um, then uh, this leads to all sorts of problems in terms of national uh, sovereignty. So, I mean, of course, I think we, we all would agree that every person has the right to leave their country, that is to emigrate with an E, uh, but whether they, they have the right to enter another country uh, is a separate question that depends upon the whims and, and will of the, of the country that they're hoping to, to, to land in. And calls for, for open borders, I think, are undoubtedly the most significant, if politically unrealistic, example of this. But this kind of thinking also shows up in other ways as well. I think the, the conflation of refugee policy with immigration policy, that is, you know, work visas and so on, is a, is a really good example of this, where, whereas the grounding of those two, those two principles is different. What I think is unhelpful about uh, Dr. Amstutz's critique is that is his willingness to use these communitarian, uh, cosmopolitan labels uh, is, is what I would say is really a shorthand for disagreement about the details. Um, I would say despite um, a clear written record about um, Southern Baptists and, and, and my organization's uh, views on these, these things, he chooses to sort of try to read behind what we've said and see a sort of lurking, uh, looming, un, unspoken cosmopolitanism uh, behind uh, behind our thinking, and I think this is particularly puzzling because one of one of the one of the most helpful sections of his book is he sort of works through uh, different worldviews in terms of how the nations work work and come together, and talks about their various contributions. Or another way of putting this is their their overlap with the Christian worldview. And one of the things that he says is that you know their cosmopolitanism offers uh, you know sort of three broad areas of overlap. One of which is the the idea that that uh, the primacy of the well-being of persons over states is, 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 uh, is significant. He offers a couple of others, which I won't mention. Uh, but my point is this. Um, based on PRI's uh, 2008 American Values Survey, they just released it last week with, with Brookings. It's worth taking a look at if you, haven't, if you haven't had a chance to look at it. There is now basically a 40 to 50 percent gap uh, between Republicans and Democrats on almost every major immigration issue. So you just go on down the line. Border security, uh, you know, what, what do we do with uh, DACA recipients? What do we do uh, with the total number of, of, of migrants? You know, you go on down the line. We're talking about a 40 to 50 percent delta between, uh, between the two populations. This, this kind of polarity is not going to get us, uh, well, it's not going to get us anywhere legislatively. I mean, you, you can't, you can't pass legislation with that kind of polarity. And so I think in this kind of environment, I think what we need to do is read each other a little bit more charitably um, and resist the urge to use these sorts of broad categories in order to cabin and discard uh, the opinions of others. And I think that is happening on both sides. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is more substantive, and that is um, um, uh, uh, how he approaches uh, uh, what he, what he I mean, the title of his book is Just Immigration, but how, how he talks about justice and the balancing uh, with other with other values, of course, the citizens of any country have the responsibility and or have the right to expect the government to carry out its God-given responsibilities. One of which uh, is the 
uh, obligation to maintain the, the, the integrity and security of the nation. Our, and I, I think our Southern Baptist uh, resolutions make this point clear. But our resolutions also draw out another dynamic uh, that is missing from Dr. Amstutz's moral analysis of, of the situation when it comes to immigration. Uh, Richard Land, uh, when he was president of my organization, was fond of saying that on our southern border we have uh, two signs that hang there, one which says keep out uh, and another uh, which reads help wanted. Um, in other words, our, our economy has, has depended uh, for, for some time now um, on illegal flows of immigration particularly low-skill immigration, and particularly within agricultural and food supply, although this is true for other sectors as well. And leaders of both parties, this is now this is a bipartisan abject failure, uh, facing economic pressure, facing pressure from the business community, um, uh, have failed to enforce our immigration laws and to secure our southern border. And so what this means is that we now have uh, in this country a labor market where there is one set of laws on the books, and we have another set of laws in practice. This, this is I'm not saying that this is good. I think that this is actually hopelessly bad, uh, but it is, and it's a situation that we need to deal with. Um, and, and I think the other, you know, the other thing that we, I think, have to acknowledge is that there, I'm not, I'm not going to say that there's a reliance interest, um, but I, I think we do have to acknowledge that these, un, these unwritten rules of the game have begun to ossify, and I think that's a question that we need, uh, we need to address. Um, in fairness uh, to Mark, he does... Um, he does write at the beginning of his book that the United States has struggled to create a front door for immigration policy and, and has therefore tolerated a back door uh, policy to provide uh, the labor uh, supply demanded by our economy. But, but what's missing from his Christian framework for immigration, which is at the end of his book and is sort of the sum of, the sum of his work, is, is any discussion of, of, of this problem, of any discussion of this, uh, of this issue, uh, when considering the justice of a, uh, of, a, of a policy towards deportation or when considering whether it might be just to uh, provide some sort of status or some sort of, uh, of pathway or restitutionary uh, measures. Let me just say, this issue, this, this sort of issue of these two dual labor markets, I'm not saying it's dispositive. Um, all I'm saying is that it's factor. Um, and. Um, you know, and, and I certainly don't think that it absolves uh, an undocumented or, or illegal immigrant uh, of, of what they have done in terms of crossing a border or in some cases stealing somebody's identity or in other cases um, uh, falsifying documents and so on. But it is a factor. It's something that we have to consider uh, when examining a solution for the 12 million undocumented immigrants uh, who reside in the United States today. Um, Dr. Amstutz writes that evangelical leaders have, have failed to consider the demands of justice when considering immigration policy. And what I'm choosing to read in this is, is his disagreement with our assessment of what is just and, and how do we balance that against other, uh, against, other, um, against other factors. And let me just say, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I think one of the most important contributions of his book is that he lays out an alternative framework in a very clear, measured way. And I think that, if, if anything, is what, uh, is what this debate needs. There's, I mean, an, an issue of, of, you know, just taking the issue of, of the, uh, you know, 12 or 11 million um, undocumented immigrants, what do we do with this population is one of the thorniest problems. There's plenty of space to disagree with. And I think one of the other things that he does really well in this book is he illuminates the fact that the Bible is not especially clear um, on, you know, the, it's not like we can go to second hesitations and, you know, immediately pull, is that, that's not the book, I guess. Um, uh, but we can go to, you know, we, we can't go exactly to a verse in the Bible and, and you know, there we have, you know, our, our eight-point roadmap to comprehensive immigration reform. So there is room for disagreement. I think we have to, uh, I think we have to um, allow. So I want to close by saying this. Um, if, if we are going to move forward, uh, to a constructive place um, on these issues. I think we have to forge consensus on what issues are debatable, uh, but also uh, what issues are not debatable. And I think there are some that we can agree to disagree on. I think there are others that we can't. Um, so we're, you know, we're now here uh, four, four days before um, election day. Um, I'm pretty tired of politics, but the 2020 campaign, I think, is going to start um, on Wednesday. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess it's already started. I mean, we, uh, the, well, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve comment. Um, um, 
and these issues, you know, the, the, you know the, the fate of the House and the fate of the Senate are hanging in the balance. I mean, I think we can all agree that this particular election cycle has been really heated. Um, it's been unusually heated. I, I think if you look at early voting numbers, I was just looking at them before I, I, I walked over here. Um, you know, this looks more like a presidential election than it does, uh, than it does a midterm election. Um, and if you look at what the closing message of the Republican Party, this, this jobs not mobs message, uh, it certainly connects directly to, uh, to the sort of Kavanaugh proceedings, but the issue of immigration has also taken on a dominant role um, in the closing argument. Uh, the opportunity to do so has been provided by a slow moving caravan coming from Honduras, um, and also what, you know, what I think we could regard as off the cuff uh, comments um, on birthright or uh, use solely uh, citizenship. Uh, but this closing argument, particularly an ad released by the GOP that directly connects the despicable um, uh, convicted cop killer uh, who's headed to death row, uh, who's also an illegal, an illegal immigrant, with uh, this entire caravan of people um, uh, headed north who are coming for a variety of different reasons. Um, I think we should be troubled by that. Um, but, it, but all of this, this sort of closing argument, really is not all that surprising. Again, if you just look at public opinion surveys, if you look at uh, this 2018 uh, American, Sur uh, American Value Survey that I mentioned before, immigration is now the number three issue for Republican voters behind the economy and national security, which in the context of an issue like the caravan and the way that it's been framed is connected to, uh, is connected to immigration. Uh, the question asked respondents to select two issues out of a total of eight. Uh, Thirty-six percent of Republicans picked immigration. Only ten per, uh, percent chose abortion as one of their top two issues. So what explains this dynamic? I think, you know, there are a number of things we could point to, but, um, you know, certainly cultural anxieties uh, are one explanation. Um, but I think another is, uh, is the share of, of foreign-born uh, population in the United States, which now stands at 13.7. If you look at uh, the U.S. Census American Community Survey, which likely undercounts actually the, the number of foreign-born uh, people who are living in the United States, the share is probably three to five percent higher. This is the greatest share, as you might have read, since 1910. Um, uh, the tensions at that time ultimately led uh, to the National Origins Quota System in 1924. Uh, which was designed to significantly limit the number uh, of, of Asians arriving in the United States on the basis of race. And I think it's probably still uncontroversial to say that the national origin uh, quota system uh, was a racist policy that now resides where it belongs, which is in the dustbin of history. Um, but I hope it's also not uncontroversial to say in a room of, of Christian realists or people who are interested in this kind of thinking that um, it's within the realm of possibility that the United States could go down this path again. Um, and pass another racist immigration law uh, that, uh, in response to the tensions that exist within our country, uh, that a future generation will in turn uh, have to uh, extract and uh, collect and expel into that same uh, dust heap. So, um, what I want to say is, uh, as I'm wrapping up here, is just a couple of comments about where do we, where do we go. Um, I think, you know, most of us are, are looking at the, the discourse, regardless of your political opinion. I, I, one of the interesting statistics is that one of the area in, in the American value survey is that uh, one, of, one of the areas where Republicans and Democrats agree uh, is that they feel like strangers in their own country. Um, and I think perhaps maybe for different reasons, but um, I think all of us as we're looking around, um, the, 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 the temperature has gotten really hot. And I think as, as leaders, we have to ask ourselves, what is our obligation um, in a time like this? I think the first, so I just want to offer kind of a couple quick points in closing. Uh, the first is I think we need to get clear about the identity, uh, the identity politics um, arguments that are off limits for us. Um, totally off limits. And I think that's true on, on both sides. I mean, I, I don't want to say that this is just a problem. I mean, this is a room I'm assuming largely of conservatives, so that's what I'm speaking to. Um, but I think we've got to get really clear about that. I think we need to, I think we need to uh, uh, make a decision ahead of time about uh, what, we're, what kinds of things we're going to be willing to say and, and what kinds of things we're not going to be willing to say. I think the second thing is we need to be willing to commit ourselves to the debate. And by the debate, I mean this debate about immigration. Uh, there is a storm gathering. You know, you look at, uh, you look at uh, the time that it took between 1910, 1924, uh, uh, when, uh, when uh, the foreign-born population peaked and when uh, the, uh, the quota system was actually passed. That's a 14-year time frame. That's a long time. 
Um, I'm not convinced that we aren't, uh, you know, at the beginning or at the middle of something rather than at the end. Um, and so I think we need to commit ourselves to the debate. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that I think we need to preserve our witness. Um, so on Tuesday, of course, the gavel uh, in, in both chambers um, hangs in the balance, and that's, this is important. But what's even more important than that is our Christian witness. Um, and I know this especially acutely as a Southern Baptist. Um, our history, of course, um, you know, we, we were founded in, 19, or in 1845 um, over slavery. Um, we have, as a part of our legacy, not just uh, the baptizing um, of slave ownership in this country, we also have a legacy of baptizing Jim Crow in this country. And I think as we're looking through, you know, as we're trying to figure out, you know, our obligation of navigating these next, uh, these next few years, I don't want baptizing a new, uh, a new kind of racial animus to become part of our, you know, part of a talk that's given 30 years from now on Southern Baptists and the world. So, thanks. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Josh Mays. I'm an undergraduate at George Washington University. Um, so I was a little bit confused, uh, and I hope this isn't just my lack of education showing, uh, but I was a little confused by uh, your use of and, and conception of right uh, in your talk. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that states have a right uh, to determine who is in their country and who is not, um, which of course under post-Westphalian international order, that's, yeah. Um, that's the legal conception, but as Christians, doesn't moral obligation supersede right? Um, and you know, if, if, if we take the Niburian approach of justice being the goal of Christian international affairs, which of course, I know that's gonna be controversial in this room, but, um, uh, and we live under unjust historical circumstances, uh, it, that, that seems like an important question to consider, but I don't know. Yeah, well, I, th I mean, I think what I'd say is that, um, I mean, certainly the, the sort of Westphalian model is not the only model we've had um, on this earth. We've had a number of other sorts of models, um, but it is the prevailing one. And so um, when, I'm, when I'm saying that I, th that I think that, that nation states have the right to determine uh, who resides or doesn't reside uh, within their territories, I'm, I'm speaking not, not, not in the sort of order of, of shoulds, perhaps, but uh, merely describing the way that things are in our current system. All right, thank you. Travis, thanks for that. Um, my name's Daniel. I actually have a very similar question to that. Uh, I realize that that's really just the beginning of your talk as opposed to the other three quarters um, of your talk. But um, those, uh, th those in the discipline, uh, for any length of time, would know that uh, the concept of uh, uh, Westphalian sovereignty um, uh, uh, territorial integrity, national self-determination, uh, indeed the very notion that the nation-state, the Westphalian nation-state itself, is um, uh, a way of uh, promoting flourishing, is, 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 th that's a very contested concept. Th those are all very contested in the field as, as it is, and uh, uh, I do wonder what the wisdom of a governing body like the Southern Baptist Convention uh, is um, for commenting on it, for promoting it, for, for, for putting very public notices on, on concepts that are very contested in that matter. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I have a different answer uh, than the one that I offered before. I mean, I, th I think, um, uh, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't thought about, I, I, I hadn't thought about your question, or I hadn't thought about this issue in terms of um, are Southern Baptists trying to communicate that this is the way that the world should be, or are they accepting this as part of the way that the world is, and therefore these are part of the assumptions and rules that govern us and the way they operate in the world. I think that, I suspect that it's the latter. Thanks. Hi Travis, uh, Al Gombas. Hey, Al. Um, just to clarify for everybody, Dr. Amstutz will be speaking next week, Friday, at noon on Capitol Hill in the uh, Senate Russell Building in uh, 253. Uh, if you go to uh, info at uh, faithandlaw.org, you can RSVP and they'll provide you a Chick-fil-A lunch along with his lecture where he'll be able to tell you exactly what uh, his view is on this. Great. Thank you, guys.